the RLN on bond approach is a classic approach for modeling dynamic panel models or estimating dynamic panel models. This technique is very commonly used in predictive management where it is referred to as the GMM estimator. This is a bit misleading because GMM itself does not do anything. It does not deal with endogeneity. So uh, the reason why this is referred to as GMM estimation is that Arellano and Bond applied GMM estimation instead of some other estimation techniques. Why they did that we'll take a look at later on the video. But the important thing here is that it is not the GMM but it is a particular modeling approach that deals with endogeneity. So whenever uh, I teach students quite often a, a student perhaps from a strategy background comes and asks me to tell them about GMM estimates. Uh, so I might show the equations, I might have them uh, work and, and with Excel and implement the GMM estimation estimator and then they ask me how does GMM deal with endogeneity and my answer is it doesn't. It's the modeling approach not the estimation approach that deals with endogeneity. Therefore we need to ask two questions. What is the model and why do we use GMM and could we use some other estimation techniques to estimate the same model. Let's take a look at the Arellano and Bond approach. I used the model that I've used before as a starting point. So we have a longitudinal panel, we have measures of ROA, we have measures of CO gender, we want to estimate the causal effect of CO gender on ROA and we want to control for unobserved frontal effects. We want to estimate the within effect in this case and that is what the Arellano and Bond estimation technique does. So this estimation technique is, uh, differs from a dynamic panel of, from cross lag model in that there is only one dependent variable whereas in cross lag model we would have ROA to CO gender. But otherwise these are very similar models. Well how does an econometrician deal with this problem? Let's write the equation. So we have equation instead of ROA and CO gender I'm going to be using y and x for simplicity and we have the unobserved effect ai here. We have lag of y with one, minus one year as a predictor of y. We have x lag similar with minus one year. The lag of x does not really matter for this problem. What we need to be looking at is the effect of y and how this unobserved effect ai is, makes things more complicated. So how does an econometrician deal with this problem? Let's take a first look at a model that is a bit simpler. So we'll take a look at the model without y as a predictor. So we'll just take a look at x to y relationship with our fixed effect ai there. How do we deal with this problem? One way of dealing with this problem is to apply first differencing. So we uh, do first differencing, we take the uh, subtract the past value of y, we subtract the past value of x and uh, this eliminates the uh, unobserved effect here. So it go, does away with the unobserved effect. We estimate with OLS, we're going to be fine. We have consistent estimates. When we have the lag dependent variable as a predictor, things are more complicated. When we look at the equations of the first differencing estimator, then uh, we can see here that we have y t minus one minus y t minus 2 and we have the error term of y t minus 1 here in, in the composite error term and because this y t minus 1 is a part of this y t minus 1 so this u t minus 1 is a part of y t minus 1 we have an endogeneity problem. So this error term here is correlated with this difference. How do we deal with endogeneity problems? Use GMM is not a, a solution to endogeneity problem. Instead the solution is that we need instrumental variables. So, so what would qualify as an instrument here? Turns out that lagged values of y would qualify as instrument. For example we could use y at t minus 2 and earlier lags and why does y t minus 2 qualify as an instrument? It qualifies because it's relevant because of the autoregressive path. So y t minus 2 
it affects y t minus 1 and also it's a part of the difference by definition. It is excluded because of sequential exogeneity assumption. So the idea of sequential exogeneity is that past values are not correlated with future error terms. So, so these error terms y, u y t and u y t minus 1 are assumed to be co uncorrelated with y t minus 2. So that's an assumption of the estimation approach. So relevance comes from other regressive paths, exclusion comes from the model assumptions. And this is referred to as, as difference GMM in the literature that talks about Aralana bond estimation. It's difference GMM because we have a, a model where we have first differencing, then we use these are called levels as instruments and we have multiple instruments we estimated with GMM. We could apply other instrument and variable techniques but for some reason GMM is applied. Let's take a look at the assumptions of this technique and how they're tested. So the assumptions are the sequential exogeneity that I mentioned before. So, so y at, at zero must be or uh, must be uncorrelated with error term at time one and error term at time two and so on. So current values of y are uncorrelated with future error terms of y. No correlated error. So the u terms are, are not autocorrelated. If they are, then this approach breaks apart. There are, are a couple of tests that are commonly used. So this is an instrumental variable technique. So the sargon hansen test that we commonly used for checking for exclusion criteria in other contexts can be applied here as well. Then Aralan and Bond developed a test for testing for autocorrelation of the error term. So we assume that the error term is not autocorrelated. If these assumptions fail, typically the failure would be uh, the autocorrelation of the error term, then we can use more distant lags as instruments. So quite often in practice when this technique is applied, we, we apply it with the first lag as the instruments. We check for exclusion. If exclusion does not hold, we increase the lags and uh, ultimately we will uh, find the sufficient lag that makes the um, errors roughly uncorrelated. There's also another version of this estimator. It's called the system GMM. And the idea of system GMM is that we can make this estimator more efficient by introducing additional assumptions and introducing additional equations. Let's take a look at what the system GMM does. It's called system because it has two equations that are estimated. It is estimating a system of equations. So we have um, the model here, the levels model. So this is the model that we want to estimate. And how we estimate it is that we specify two simultaneous equations. So we estimate the beta one from, from the difference equation. We estimate beta one from the original level equation. But this is endogenous as stated before. So we have endogeneity problem because AI correlates with UY, uh, U, uh, with Y at, at T minus one. So uh, AI is correlated with every Y, so this is an endogeneity problem. How do we find instruments? Well, uh, the past differences will serve as instruments because first differencing eliminates the unobserved effect AI. So we can use earlier differences as instruments for this model and estimate it consistently. Because we have two models that we can use for estimating beta 1 and beta 2, this is more efficient than estimating uh, beta 1 and beta 2 from, from just this difference model. Relevance of this instrument is by definition, so uh, difference and, and uh, level are correlated by definition also because of autocorrelation, autoregression and uh, exclusion comes from sequence of exogeneity assumption and difference removes AI from here. So this is the system GMM. And now the question that we have is why do we use GMM? So this is a general approach. We could use any instrument or variable estimator to estimate this. Why GMM and why not some other estimates? There are basically two reasons that I can think of why GMM is being applied. Both relate to time. So this was introduced in 1991 
which at the time of recording is about 30 years ago. And at that point, the computational resources that we had were much less than what we have today. Nowadays, we could estimate this model with maximum likelihood, find a numerical solution to the likelihood function, and uh, in seconds. In 1991, this is not feasible. GMM is a lot easier to calculate. We just apply matrix algebra. There's no iteration, no numerical optimization involved. This is uh, quick to calculate. So that's one, one reason. Another reason is that GMM at that time happened to be the state of the art of multiple equation estimation in econometrics. So this is uh, GMM is used more for historic reasons than for reasons that relate to the uh, superiority of this approach over other approaches. This technique, Arellan and Bond technique, is not without its problems. These problems are explained, for example, in Allison's article. And uh, Allison notes that if the number of, of cases n, or number of firms, number of whatever, are our observational unit that we observe multiple times over time, if that n is small, then there will be bias. This is also inefficient. So uh, we can get more efficient estimators using maximum likelihood based techniques. And uh, we can use multiple lags and which lags we apply, which variables we use as instruments, it is not clear. And there's a problem that when we go, when we have a complicated model, we have a large number of instruments and increasing the number of instruments increases the bias of instrument variable approaches. There is also another approach, another problem with this approach, and it is that this is being used as a black box. So the fact that researchers say that they use GMM estimation to deal with the endogeneity problem indicates that not everyone might understand that it's not the GMM, it's the instrumental variables that deal with endogeneity. So uh, if you think that it is the GMM that does the trick, then uh, you might not really understand what you're doing. And it's easy to use this as a black box because of status implementation of the technique XGA bond. And you just specify the equation. It gives you estimates. You don't really need to understand what you're doing. And this estimator, like others, makes some assumptions. If those assumptions are not fulfilled, then the estimates can be very misleading. So there's a more modern way of solving the same problem. And it's simply to specify the model using a, a path diagram or, or syntax in your statistical software as a structural equation model using the wide format data and then specify the constraints that are required. This has a couple of advantages. The first advantage is that this is more efficient than the Aralan and Bond approach. So maximum likelihood estimates are, have proven to be the most efficient possible in large samples. There are other advantages in the maximum likelihood based approach using the SCM software. Another one, it's easier to understand what is being measured, what is being modeled, and what are the assumptions. So here we assume that the uh, alpha, the unobserved effect, is correlated with all the predictors. So we don't make the random effects assumption. And we also assume uh, the uh, sequence of exogeneity. So uh, x1 is uncorrelated with aerotherm of y2, y3, and y4 because they are uncorrelated with all the future values. x3, on the other hand, is allowed to be correlated with aerotherm of y2 because that is in the past. So we are allowing some, some correlations with the error terms. We're constraining others. Specifying this as a path diagram makes it more explicit what you are actually assuming. Then we have uh, modern missing data procedures available. So we could actually uh, estimate this model even if we're missing data. With the GMM approach, it would not be at least as straightforward. We would have to set up multiple imputation and other things, which is complicated with a structural equation model. And we can simply apply full information, maximum likelihood, which takes the missing data into account automatically. And then finally, we have better diagnostics. So you just need to understand one tool and the same chi-square test, the same modification indices, the same covariance residuals can be applied that you apply with these uh, models 
every time. So you don't need to remember that there is an RL and a bond test for autocorrelation. You can just apply the more general techniques that you already should know. There are disadvantages. Specifying this kind of model is cumbersome if there are a large number of observations. We tend to see y format data in organizational psychology where the time series are rather short. If you collect data with survey then five uh, time points that's quite a lot. If you get data from databases like we uh, economists do, strategy management researchers often do, then you may, might get 30 years of data for each company. So specifying this kind of model for 30 years would be a bit complicated and it would, would be a bit hard for the computer to calculate as well. Fortunately, uh, there are techniques, for example, dynamic structural ecosystem modeling implemented in M plus that takes care of, of this problem. So that's a special technique for estimating dynamic panel models using maximum likelihood without having to specify this kind of uh, model with these multiple different dependent variables. Then uh, key is to specify large models. That is true. But fortunately, this can be automated. For example, there is an, a state of package called XTDP ML written by Paul Allison, if I, if I remember correctly, and that automates the specification of this kind of dynamic panel model with unobserved effect using status SCM command. So you run this command, it prints you the SCM syntax and then you run the SCM. Then there is the multivariate normality assumption of the maximum likelihood estimation. But as I explained in other videos, this is something that we can deal with. We can use alternate estimation approaches, but even better, we can just use ML because it is consistent and simply apply robust standard errors to deal with the fact that the standard errors from ML and the test statistics may not be trustworthy if the data are severely non-normal. So this is a, a more modern alternative and in many ways more recommended than the RLN and bond approach. For reasons of history, the RLN and bond approach is still very common while it's dated.